So let's go to uh, now these. Here, here you go. You got these warriors, all right? And they're ready to go. And all of a sudden, they're going to have to wait. This is also about waiting and hearing from God in this scripture. And because here in a little while, once they're circumcised, they're going to have to wait. And I don't know about y'all, but you know, probably the closest times I am to God is when I'm sick or hurt or you know, something like something bad happens. And obviously, to me, that's pretty bad. And, uh, you know, and also, you know, these guys, you know, so far as men, these, are, these guys were a lot more hardcore menly men than we are. You know, our actually testosterone levels, uh, they were probably, they could have been four times as strong as we were. Our testosterone levels now today are probably, well, I mean, 50% of the population has low T. That's because we're ingesting all these estrogens in the water and products and that kind of stuff. So, but so these guys, you know what I'm saying? These guys were like 13 year olds for, you know, these guys lived 969 years. They were having babies, you know, uh, Adam had a baby at what, 136 years old at Seth. I mean, these guys were virulent. That's a good way to put it. These guys were very virulent. So all of a sudden now these guys got to get cut on and you know, the third day in scripture, we'll see, we'll turn back to Genesis, but third day was like the most painful day. So you can imagine, I mean, you know, infection, they're freaking out. I would be freaking out, but they got to trust in God. So, and, and again, Joshua, and they've just crossed this river. Now, they grew up, you know, seeing the pillar of fire and the manna, the, you know, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and the manna falling from heaven. And when you grow up with that kind of stuff, like, you know, if you grew up circumcised, it ain't no big deal. But I can promise you, you get circumcised at that age, every time, and it may, may have been another thing is God's reminder. I mean, you know, a couple times a day, you're going to be looking down. Now, when you get it done at an older age, I can promise you'll remember that. I don't remember it. You know, I was, I don't, you know, eight days old, you're not remembering anything. But at 48, I promise you, you'll remember it. <laughs> and that may have been another, hey, you know, you're my people. And uh, here's the covenant, you know. And, uh, and also, you know, I, I was reading that in Egypt, you know, they were like, man, these Israelites, they're having babies just incredibly. And the Egyptians weren't like that. You know, so God, you know, God said, hey, you know, go out and multiply. And he, uh, you know, I'm not saying that other societies, but maybe the Israelites just, you know, he blessed supernaturally with virulence, if you will. Um, but anyway, so uh, getting back to that. Um, so these guys, here's the warriors. You got Jericho over here. They just crossed the river. And he, what did he do to his army? He just incapacitated them. All right, I mean, literally, if... Jericho or the, uh, the Amorites wanted to come down out of the hills, they were done. I mean, they were done. God could have supernaturally protect them, and he would have, I believe, because he told Joshua, hey, as long as you follow my word, no one can come against you. No one can come against you. Um, but these guys had to wait. So, you know, and they had to know that in Genesis 34, uh, um, you know, verse 24, that and we can go there, because that's, that's kind of, hopefully I got that one right. I believe it's Genesis 34, <laughs> 24, jeez. And uh, my eyes ain't working right today for some reason. 34, 24. Here we go. Um, and all who went out of the gate of this city heeded Hamor and Shechem, his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of the city. Now it came to pass on the third day when they were in the plain that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Denia's brother, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor and Shechem, uh, his son with the edge of the sword and took Denia from Shechem's house and went out. All right, they raped her. 
All right. So then they said, hey, you marry her and all's good, you know, and they've tricked them. But you got to be circumcised. So they taught these guys into circumcising this whole city. And then on the third day when they were in the most pain, they went and killed them. And don't think that they didn't know this story as it's being passed down. And they don't think they were just going, wait a minute, the sins of our fathers. Oh, man, you reckon we're fixing to get paid back for what our, you know, what our fathers did? So they knew, and I can assure you Joshua knew, you know, this story. That, hey, you know, that, you know, they went out and it, it renders you basically helpless. So, but they trusted in the Lord. So now we're back to the waiting part. And there's, you know, these, these people, there's a lot of these, well, we all have things that need to be circumcised from our heart. You know, our flesh is our worst enemy. Um, and so as these guys were sitting there incapacitated, in pain, I can assure you, probably the majority of them were crying out to God. You know, and, and, and God was doing a work in their heart. And maybe that's what he was doing. It's like, hey, now you've entered my promised land. And now, you know, I want that heart change. And I want you to just see, you know, you, you've got to trust in me. And, and that, I believe that's what happened. So now they're, they're trusting in the Lord. I'm going to read the, then you read on through it. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out and had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised like we talked about before. We just don't understand why they didn't do it. It was probably disobedience, um, which also means at some point, you know, some of them couldn't partake in that Passover. I noticed, I believe it was the second year that they were out, I saw they had Passover after they left out of Egypt. But I don't believe it recorded after that that they ever, you know, maybe they had it up until the, a certain point. But I did see, read on that second year that they had it, because I thought they did, you know, if you're reading through, somebody's like, they never have Passover again. But I did see where they had Passover on, I believe, that second year. Um, and at some point, they stopped because there was not enough of them to... Is that? Was that one of them? This is coming up on another one. So, wow, I did not know that. Thank you. Um, for all the people who had come out of Egypt, circumcised, uh, but all the born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt and had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had shown their fathers, and he would give us a land flowing of milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons, whom he raised up in their place. So, you know, Joshua, godly man, warrior. Uh, now Moses has laid hands on him, filled him full of the Spirit, um, is now um, leading these people. But he also it also says that he had raised these these young men up. Um, so now they've, got a, they've had a godly man raise, raising them up. So I would think this generation is better off than the last. Um, so it was when they had finished circumcising. All the people that they stayed in their places... And camp till they were healed. Um, so again, uh, they were waiting, and you know, lots of times we rush. 
You know, they were ready to rush in. Lots of times, we rush in. New believers, on fire, baby. I was one of them, you know. And to be honest with you, you know, I wish I had that same fire that I had, you know, and, and I don't know how long people can keep that up, you know. I, I can't or didn't, you know. Now, I always but we can go back to that, you know, and that's striving to get back to that. But, you know, even though these guys were fixing to rush in with the godly goals and godly ambitions, that doesn't mean that God was ready for you to do it yet. And, you know, I know as a new believer, you know, I would just do crazy. Th- I mean, I would, man, you know, I, I regret that, you know, I don't do some of those things that I used to do. I'd go to people, and once I figured out, you know, God wanted me to minister to the sick, you know, I would walk, I would, it got to the point to where, I would pull up into a parking lot. I was always going to Lowe's Hardware because of what I do for a living. And I'd look and see how many people were in a handicapped parking space. That's how, I mean, that's how intense it was. And then when I, I saw every handicapped person that there was, well, I can assure you if they were sick, I saw them. And I would be walking through the aisles, there'd be somebody in a wheelchair. Oh, man. All right, here I go. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Jim. It's Carson. What's up, man? Hey, man, I need you to pray for a man who's laid down the aisle. All right, we're going to do it, man. Go do what you got to do. All right, hey, man, you go to church anywhere? Yeah, I go to church. church. Can I pray for you? I'd anoint her and pray for her. And I can't tell you how many times I did that a lot. You know, I hate that, you know, I don't do that like I used to. You know, and that's uh, something that I miss. You know, I mean, I remember one time... Uh, I was in Lowe's again in uh, uh, Greensboro, and there was this uh, Asian lady that came up with a hat, had a SARS mask on, going to people asking for a ride, and she couldn't even hardly speak any English. She had a note, handing them a note, and I'm in a hurry, and I saw that, and I was like, nah, man. And I got about two blocks away, and the Lord's like, nah, go back. I was like, ah. So I pulled back up, and she had just got rejected by another guy, and, you know, <laughs> I said, can I help you? He's like, I want to ride. And I was like, well, okay. I want to ride to Oak Ridge. I said, well, I got to run this stuff, and then I'll go, you know. And as we were driving, you know, I started talking to her, but she was from Vietnam. I personally think that she was in the sex slave trade. That's what I personally think. She had uh, painted nails. I I could not tell you to this day what she looked like. Um, Had nice clothes on, but she was running. She was running from something, so... And this is this blows my mind. I, I always said, you know, I'm not, and I should have. You know, it's like I'm not going to make a list of the people I've seen healed or the, or the miracles and stuff, and now I regret it. Because I, God knows. That was my deal. God knows. I don't need to make a list of it. But I should have, yeah, he knows, but I should have made a list to remind myself. You know, so maybe that's a point today is like, hey, when something cool happens in our lives, man, write it down. So you can go back when you're like, Oh, man, I forgot, forgot, and I have forgotten. I guarantee you, it's still there, but I've forgotten about the supernatural things that I've seen. So this girl, so I'm sitting in this car, not, not mentioning there's nothing about Kernersville, on my car, in my car, never mentioned it. I think I'm going to take her to Oak Ridge. She was trying to catch a train. There ain't no train in Oak, to Charlotte, I think. We wanted to go to Oak Ridge and then go to Charlotte. I can't remember, but there won't no train in Oak Ridge. So I get back into the car. And I was like, okay. She's like, I want to go to Kernersville. I like fell out in the floor. I was just like, you want to go to Kernersville? And she said, Kernersville. I said, all right. So I started driving, and she had grew up around Catholicism. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to share the Lord and trying to get her to let me pray for her. And she wouldn't do it. Never did let me lay hands on her. So I said, so I'll, so I'll take you to Kernersville, all right. So we're coming back down 421. I said, that's my church. So we pull in here, and we swing around the cafe, and uh, I had uh, somebody go get Margaret. So Margaret comes back anyway. She drinks two or three, I think it's three Diet Cokes. And um, she saw all of the, you know, she was looking around everything, and then she had some type of chest problem, some type of cough or something. And so Margaret uh, wanted to take her, and get her this stuff. So when she did, um, that was it. But as we were standing out here in the parking lot, um, and I was talking to her, she was, Margaret was fixing to take her and, and leave. Um, she looked at me and she said, are you a Jew? And I looked at her. 
because all the things in the cafe, she said, are you Jewish? And uh, she could speak a little English. She said, are you Jewish? And I said, no, but Jesus was. And I said, you know, and uh, then that, that was it. She still wouldn't let me, let me pray for her. And then she was gone. But, you know, so we got her here. And I don't know, you know, what the Lord did with that. But, I mean, that blew my mind. I mean, that was just, I mean, where did she come up with Kernersville, man? I mean, that was just, you know, that was just crazy. Um, but uh, anyway, um, but those things, you know, those crazy things that we did. But sometimes uh, it was reminding me of like the pastors. An average term of a pastor is two years. All right, so I'm assuming go to divinity school, come out, I'm ready to go. And they go, and then they hit the ministry field. And obviously, the average pastor is two years. Something's, something's amiss. And it just reminds me of, hey, you know, are they waiting before they do that? Like Pastor D.A. Or, or Pastor Sean Bumpers, you know, who sat and waited and learned and just didn't rush out, you know, and waited on the Lord. And now, matter of fact, I'm, a, I'm not going to I, so I'm looking up videos and stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to watch a couple of videos on Joshua 5 teaching. All right. So I looked at a few, listened to a few. So all of a sudden, here's, and I'm going to hit one more Friday night. And I said a little cool, little, look like a little kid thing, like our children's ministry with a sword through it. I was like, click. Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm like, no way. So I sat there and hit play, and there was Pastor Sean teaching on uh, Joshua 5, man. And I was just, like, blown away. And when we went to Alabama, you know, we were a part of that. This, this church, this fellowship was a part of helping him. We hung the Calvary Chapel sign up. Um, we did some plumbing and stuff, fixing his bathrooms. Uh, we did some painting and stuff um, right when he was just starting. And to see that, I was like, man, that blew me away. I mean, that really did. And uh, it was funny, I was sitting there listening to him, he was like, Hill of the Foreskins, he's like, man, could you imagine if your address was Hill of the Foreskins? He said, how would that be, you know, and I just started laughing. But, uh, but he's, he's a good teacher. But again, they waited on the Lord. You know, there's lots of things in, in our life um, that, uh, um, that we need, you know, we need to wait sometimes. And uh, maybe a job or... Um, you know, something in ministry that, hey, we think we want to go do that, but we're not prepared to do that yet. You know, it's just like up here teaching. I taught the kids for five years now, five, six. I'm, I've been teaching the kids for six years. I couldn't imagine not doing that and getting up here and then trying to share it. I'm, I'm sure it's not good anyway, but I could not imagine not doing that for six, I mean, not for six years and then coming up and saying, hey, Carson, I, you're going to teach. I would be freaking out, you know, not that I'm not now, but still, I mean, you know, I've had to go in there on the fly, changing teachings and just open the Bible up and just, you know, just let the Holy Spirit roll, man. I even look at the lesson plan, just going in there and just teaching the kids what the Lord's got. And so, again, you know, again, just waiting on the Lord. I definitely was not prepared, you know, back then to do that. And, uh, you know, and... So, you know, things in life are, you know, lots of times we just have to wait on the Lord. And then he puts us in that position sometimes where we don't have a choice, you know. And God's like, hey, I'm going to stop and you, you're going to sit down and I want you to hear from me. And probably the biggest one, not the biggest one, but one of the ones I remember was the cross out back. So Pastor David said, hey, I uh, want to do a little prayer garden back there. Some driving around the back and God said, you got it. And I'm like, huh? He's like, you got it. And I was like, no, nah, we got it. I want some type of cross. All right, that's cool. So all of a sudden, I was thinking cedar. I personally believe that Jesus died on a cedar tree. There's Some people say figs, some people whatever. I mean, cedar was a predominant tree in Lebanon. And, you know, it doesn't, it, does, it resists decay. It's purple inside. Our blood's purple. It's purple inside, and it's got a sweet fragrance to it. I'm thinking, yeah, you know, that's the tree. So I go to cut this thing down. My friend of mine's in Virginia has got this cedar tree. So I go cut this thing down. At the time, I was struggling with anxiety, and I told y'all before, God healed me from that. But, man, I went to go cut this thing down, and, ooh, 
somebody, either God didn't want me, you know, the devil was afflicting me and God was allowing it to happen. Is it was not supposed to happen right then, but I didn't know I won't get in that picture. I was a new believer. I really didn't understand that. So the cross that's on the front of the building, when we took it down, I took it to Virginia to my farm, and I miss it. This is back up, but that's where it's supposed to be. So I would always go to it, and I would pray. You know, if I'd pray, I'd go to that cross. And, man, I remember that first time I hit my knees and just crying out to God, I felt like I was going to die and have a heart attack. And I got back up, and then the next week, yeah, I, I cut this thing down, man, and here it came again. Even harder, my wife was with me, so I went to the cross, and, and uh, you know, she prayed over me, and it was dead calm, and the wind started to blow. And then I got up, and I heard God say, now you can go do it in my strength, but not in your own. So here I am. It's a tree, man. I've cut down bunches of trees. You know, I'm going to cut down a tree right now, but I couldn't cut down that tree because God knew how powerful that would be, and he didn't want me to do it. And my strength, I had to cut that tree down in God's strength. You know, I did not. And that's just a simple example. I, I could not do it. Couldn't go cut a tree down. You know, and then didn't know it, but three weeks later, you know, Easter Sunday, that cross was up there on that stage. And then uh, Pastor David had his own little battle of, of the enemy not wanting that happen. But, you know, supernaturally God, he made it here. He was super sick. Um, but, man, I'll never forget that day when we went up there and, Laid hands on that cross, I cried like a baby. But treat us in the prayer garden. Treat us in the prayer garden. But again, that was, you know, that was just God wanted me to wait. And I want to go do it in my own strength. I wasn't listening to him. If I'd have been listening, he'd probably be like, hey, you know, just wait, you know, but I was ready to go cut it down. And nope, I had to wait. Um, so, all right, with that. We'll break into groups, and I'll pray, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and uh, Lord, we uh, thank you for this day, and thank you for Jesus, and thank you for this teaching tonight. Lord, and I pray that, um, that some of the guys got some useful information out of it. And uh, Lord, we just uh, thank you for your spirit, and thank you uh, um, that when we wait on you, um, That, uh, that we hear from you, Lord, and that maybe that tonight, may we just, may each and every one of us hear your voice uh, when you speak. You know, maybe uh, we've gotten away from hearing, or maybe we didn't want to hear what you uh, wanted to say to us. Um, that, you know, we need that circumcision of the heart, um, Father, so that, uh, you know, we can uh, continue to let you uh, guide us uh, down that path that you want us on. Um, so, Father, we just thank you for this day, and uh, Thank you for Jesus and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.